Afternoon, it's Mike Fulcher here. Uh, I'm running this webinar today about uh, a, a reflection on a week of telehealth for most of us. So um, I'm just going to pause while people join us. Um, I guess the, the reality is it's not a great time possibly for, for many of you. And uh, I'm thinking that we're probably going to get quite a small group to this webinar. And I thought that perhaps we could aim to be a little bit more interactive. Um, so I can see there's about 40 of us. Uh, what I, what I was kind of hoping would happen is that I'd get some questions from, from you guys. Um, there's also, I think, an opportunity for me to, to invite people to come and talk and share some experiences. So I thought we could spend the next maybe 30 minutes, 40 minutes, just talking about what's worked well, uh, what hasn't worked well, and just trying to learn from each other about the week. So um, I've got some questions that people have emailed me in advance, um, but I am, as I said, really keen to hear from you guys uh, about your practice, what, what's, uh, what's happened with you guys. So the first question I had was um, about what to do when the internet doesn't work very well. Um, and look, uh, all, I guess it's not necessarily the internet, it's the telehealth platforms, but um, I guess my key advice and my key uh, learning over the last few months has been um, the need to be really flexible. So um, the technology doesn't always work and it's not always your fault. So on our platform, we can see uh, what device and what sort of internet connection um, our patient has. Um, and you can see often that they're on a, on a phone, they've often got very poor internet. And so despite all your best efforts and all your planning and despite investing in the best platform, it's just not gonna work for everybody. So I think my main advice is about being flexible. Um, and that might mean uh, in some situations using the phone. Um, I had a day where the video worked really, really well uh, within our platform, but the audio was terrible. Um, so what I would get patients to do would be log on with the video and then ring them um, and talk to them uh, using just the phone. So you still got the video element, but you also had good quality audio. And I guess there have been a couple of situations where the consultation just hasn't gone very well. Um, and so I've had to end the conversation and, uh, and follow up the patients um, up you know, once we're able to physically see them. So I think that flexibility is a really important element when running a telehealth consultation. Um, I've got a, a question here from Kate about uh, good ideas to reach out for new clients. Um, and I, I don't know, Kate, whether you were on the, the, the webinar last night about marketing, but there was some quite good su suggestions uh, during that or, or ideas uh, for simple things that we could potentially all be doing. Um, and so that's probably a good place to look. So that will be on our Facebook page later on today. Um, but I guess my main thing is engaging with the people that refer you patients or send you patients anyway. So uh, I guess in a way that's, that's kind of what I'm doing now is, uh, is trying to get out and let you guys know that I'm, st I'm still here um, and trying to do that in a constructive way. Um, I guess the other thing is, uh, is for you, maybe you might work with a sports team. Maybe you might work for a sporting organization. And so I think that that would be a really important avenue to, to go out and engage with and let people know that you're still there. Um, Simon's other advice was just simple things like uh, on, your, on the homepage on your website or your Facebook page, making sure that it's clearly stated there that you're still open for business um, and changing the, um, and changing the, um, the messages on your phone. So when people ring and you can't answer for whatever reason, they know that you're still there and it's not, you're not answering because uh, you're not interested in seeing them. Um, there is a, a question here from Gavin, which um, maybe is best answered by everybody else, is around are people co-charging patients in this initial stage of telehealth? Um, the way that our, our, our practice is structured, um, we have a fully funded service, so we're not actually actively charging patients. Um, but our platform is uh, set up so that we can go out and within the consultation, we can ask them to pay um, and they can put their credit card details in there. Um, but that would be a good one if, if other people could maybe indicate what they're doing um, just by either, um, well, actually the best way is just down the bottom on the Q&A button. So if you scroll down to the bottom, you'll be able to see a Q&A and uh, the, the chat option as well. Good job, uh, Nicola. Um, so um, there's some feedback there about free initial consultations, uh, smaller, maybe reduced co-payment. Um, another thing that uh, people asked about was, you know, what are you doing in advance of a consultation? Um, 
And I guess that whole preparation piece is something that I think is really, really important. So um, things like making sure that the backdrop to your consultation looks halfway decent and it looks like you've made some sort of effort to make it look nice. Um, I've been making an effort every day, even though I'm not seeing patients today, to put a shirt with a collar on um, so that you sort of look halfway professional um, because you are trying to sell a service that maybe is unfamiliar to the patient. Um, and, and then the other thing is just making sure that you're ready to go. So I talked before about having the best possible internet connection that you can, um, that you're communicating in advance, ideally to the patient, about what their consultation might be like. Um, making sure that the way you want to share information is ready to go. So um, I often share screens with my patients um, to show them their imaging. So I need to, in advance, make sure that the last patient um, their details are not on my screen anymore and that I've logged their their uh, their scans on. So there's a whole lot of little niggly process things that I think as clinicians we need to be aware of. And the other bit that I haven't really touched on uh, just in that answer is around making sure that your administrative processes are okay. So can the patient still find you? Um, can they still book an appointment through their normal channels? If the answer to that is no, how can you tell them how to book your, your patient? Um, I don't know if you've seen the, the chat there, but there's definitely some variance about what um, what people are doing re regarding co-payments. I'm not sure whether you guys get the, the comms from ACC, but there has been some changes around uh, what's considered essential service um, because uh, physios now, if you're treating acute or emergency problems, um, you are still de you're now deemed to be an essential service. So there is an opportunity for you guys to... Um, to see patients physically, whether you want to take that up or whether you think ethically that's a good idea at the moment. Um, but that potentially is going to change some of your working lives. And I think another, something to think about is, are you prepared to do that? So uh, do you have uh, systems and processes in place to make sure that you, your patient, um, and your staff are safe? Um, so I, have, I don't know whether you've seen those comms, but that came out yesterday. Um, Another question was, what do I do with regard to patient consent, um, which I think is a really important issue. And um, I uh, get verbal consent at the start of all of my consultations. And it is, it is a bit awkward, actually. Um, it's sort of a strange start to the conversation. So uh, often I find you click the button, someone you've never met before, and you quite abruptly end up in their waiting room. Um, so I spend a little bit of time introducing myself and who I am. Um, then I ask them whether they've ever had a telehealth conversation, and most of them say no, although I suspect that that may start to change for a lot of the patients. Um, and then um, they often will say something like, I'm used to talking on Zoom, or I'm used to talking on, on um, Skype, or something like that. And I make a, a point of saying, look, this is a different sort of this conversation. Um, we're going to try and treat this like a normal medical consultation. I'm going to talk to you about your problem. I'm going to try and examine you and we're going to share uh, some other things. Are you happy with that type of consultation? And, and I also say, and I, I make a joke about, you know, look, who's on, I can't see who's on the other side of the screen. You want to make sure your coworkers aren't listening in. Um, and I think that that's a reasonably good way to introduce the consultation, which is, is relatively relaxed and informal, but it is quite strange. So, um, Making a special point, I think, every time uh, to do that, um, I think, is important. Luke's m making a good point about ACC 45. So there is some regulatory information that you must talk to each patient about. I think there are three different points. Um, yeah, which, again, Luke has posted. So um, my take on that, Luke, is that, that those are for patients that where you're initiating a new ACC 45 and I had a conversation with one of our relationship managers at ACC uh, this morning, actually, and they weren't totally sure, but that was their position as well. So um, I am following up on that, and we'll post that, I guess, online um, if we find out. But definitely we can be doing ACC 45s, um, but I don't read that to every patient, uh, and I believe that that is okay. So I, I am documenting in my notes that I have I've achieved consent, um, but I'm doing that verbally and uh, I, I'm not doing that in a formal way. Um, there was also some conversation about the limitations of the consultation. So 
um, when we spoke about uh, telehealth consultations last week. Um, that is one of the things that I think is the most important to acknowledge. So every patient I'm talking about consent, I'm also explaining about the limitations of the con consultation. Um, and patients readily understand that. They understand um, that you're not physically there, that you can't touch them. Um, I talked to them about how it requires uh, a bit of flexibility and a, a can-do attitude. And uh, the, the physical examination that I'm doing, um, they often feel a bit bemused about, but usually they'll get quite into it. Um, and so I think the main thing to, to acknowledge at the end of it is that um, it is not as good as a face-to-face -face consultation but it can still be a very good consultation. So um, this week, it's sort of been a crazy week. Um, I've diagnosed a femoral neck fracture. Someone fell over and fractured their femoral neck. Um, a, another pelvic fracture. I diagnosed a guy with polymyalgia rheumatica. Um, and these are all things over the phone, um, assisted by imaging, assisted by blood tests. Um, they're not your normal run of the ordinary um, uh, a kind of easy medical consultation. So um, I'm just going to have a quick look at some of these questions. Um, a thorough subjective. So yeah, so look, in, I don't know what they teach you exactly at physical school, but at, at medical school, it's all about the history, the history, the history. So things that patients tell us, If the, one of the things that I found quite cool about the, um, the telehealth platform is that you have to listen that much more carefully to the patient. So if you're not listening to the patient, if you're not giving them your full attention, then I really think you're not going to be able to do a good consultation. Um, the other thing is that I personally have been, um, I guess in some situations, my threshold to get some imaging has been lowered um, because I can't examine them. And so there's the whole conversation around what is, what is required, what is urgent, what is acute, what is immediate. Um, and having to make a values judgment yourself, but also um, with your patient about what you think you can justify in the current landscape. Um, we sort of touched on it before, but what is an essential service? And I would say most of the patients that, that we're seeing, you know, it would be very hard to justify seeing them face to face. Um, but I think there are some examples that, are, you know, they are essential services. So, um, I, uh, Simon talked about arranging, or I think it was Steve actually earlier this week talked about arranging a steroid injection for a patient um, who couldn't physically uh, toilet themselves. Um, I've had a couple of patients this week with very significant radicular leg pain. So while that not, might not be a, a, you know, a medical emergency that requires admission to the hospital, um, that is a very uncomfortable, unpleasant problem. And I think that that needs to be resolved. Uh, the two patients I mentioned who both had fractures, um, they couldn't wait there. So um, my level of suspicion based on their history, based on their inability to wait there, I felt it was probable that they had a problem um, that required some further imaging and, a, and an anatomical diagnosis. So yes, could they have waited? Well, yes, they could have, but I believe um, that their acuity was, was great enough that I, I felt that it was important to investigate those people. So. I think if you are thinking about seeing patients face to face, and if you are trying to decide that your service is indeed an emergency service or an acute service, you need to be comfortable about, um, about the service you're offering and be prepared to justify it to your peers. I think that's, that's always a good way if you're thinking about whether you should be doing something. If I had to have this conversation with my colleague and explain what I'm doing, could I do that and feel comfortable about it? If I had to have this conversation with the Ministry of Health or ACC, would I feel comfortable with it? Would I feel, um, would I feel able to justify that? So um, those are a couple of points. Um, there's, uh, I, I think I mentioned there's some variance about co-payments and what people are charging. Um, I'm not sure whether anyone has any other questions or uh, whether they want to contribute anything. Um, Another uh, point or a question that was, or discussion I had was about learning from your mistakes. So if you're thinking about how to improve your service or how to be better at anything, I think it's really important to have some self-reflection um, and being quite clear about things that did work well or didn't work well. Um, and I think that we'll probably find over time that there are some types of patients that we're not gonna be able to help in this medium. 
Um, there's some types of patients that we might need to refer on. Uh, there was an example that was shared earlier this week about a patient, uh, I, I think it was someone who posted a comment, a patient who took their shirt off um, and weren't wearing a bra and some consent issues and, and feeling that that didn't really feel comfortable to them. Um, and maybe that could be avoided by uh, a Sorry, I think we dropped off there. I wonder whether uh, someone could flick me a text just to say that, that they're happy that we're back online. Um, we're just talking about uh, some of the processes around um, making sure that we're comfortable, <laughs> great, um, that we're comfortable with the processes and we're comfortable with, uh, with what we're doing. So um, the example of uh, making sure that patients understand how the consultation works, I think is a very good one. Um, there's a question here from Luke about some confidentiality and privacy issues with Zoom. Um, my understanding is that that is a, a platform that does clearly uh, fulfill the requirements of telehealth, um, the communications and the way that the audio and data uh, are sent through to the patient uh, all comply with uh, the regulatory standards. Um, my feedback, my, my position on Zoom is that it's a good way to talk to people. Um, but it doesn't have a lot of the other functionality that you might want in the consultation. So um, being able to pre-book those conversations as well, um, having patients join your conversation that you're already having with another patient. So I think that there are some limitations of the platform and reasons why other um, purpose-built telehealth platforms might be better. Um, but my understanding is that it is definitely an acceptable platform. Um, the uh, other thing that we talked about last night in the, the webinar about marketing that I think is a really important point um, and something that we could all probably be doing a little bit better is uh, sharing our experiences with our peers. So um, I guess we are doing that right now, but um, what is it that's working well at uh, your friend's practice? What is it that's working well um, at a practice in Wellington? Um, and Simon's point was that you might not want to share that with the practice that is uh, down the road from you because you're their direct competitor and you might not like them, um, but look further afield. So go to go find a friend or colleague in Wellington, uh, go find someone in Dunedin um, and share with them um, because I think that we're all learning rapidly about this and there'll be some things that other people discover before you uh, that you haven't thought of and rather than wait to discover it yourself you might be able to get a head start by talking to someone else um, I'm I'm aware of some some pretty entrepreneurial things that other physiotherapy practices are doing out and about um, and I, I guess just being aware what other people are doing just purely from uh, making sure that you don't get gazumped by the guy down the road is really important so having a look at what they're doing and being aware about what they're doing. Um, we're in quite an interesting position in that we've got a really broad referral base. And so we're trying really hard to work with everybody. Um, and we're working really hard to not, um, I guess, not preferentially uh, advantage one practice over another. So that for us would be a, a very bad look. Um, and, and, you know, we really, really don't want to be doing that. Um, that said, we don't always know which practices are up and running on online or on telehealth um, versus other practices that have shut up shop for a period of time. So I think, you know, making sure that, for example, you let us know, you let other medical specialists, that your GPs know clearly that you're open for business, I think is a really important one. Um, there's a question here. I've found that doing biomechanical screens, home desk setups have been quite good. You know, they get buy-in from the patient. So look, that is a great example of uh, working with the um, working with the constraints that you've got. So what is the problem that everybody has? Well, we're all working from home. Um, what are one of the problems that a lot of people will have? Well, they're working on a laptop or an iPad or something on the couch. So they're making sure that their setup is good is, um, is I think, a really neat way to think about a problem. Um, there's no sport, so where are these patients going to be? Um, another thing that was really awesome on the marketing webinar yesterday that, uh, that I thought was, was really cool and kind of one of the, the things I'd hoped might happen and, and particularly this webinar was um, there was a question from a massage therapist about 
what am I going to do with my massage therapy business when I can't actually massage anyone? And then within you know one minute, there was a whole lot of posts from um, other massage therapists saying, this is what we're doing. So um, for example, what they were doing was selling massage vouchers for in the future. They were doing a whole lot of stuff around making classes for uh, stretching and rolling and doing other things like that. So they weren't able to do massage, but they were thinking outside the box. Um, so um, those are all some things that I think I've reflected on and, and some of, you, some of uh, you guys have reflected on over the last week. Um, I guess the, the final point that I have is making sure that we're all thinking, it's not related to telehealth, it's making sure that we're all thinking carefully about what the next six months is likely to hold. Because we've been told clearly plan for six months. So we're all really focusing very hard on right now, can we get our, our referrals back? Can we get patients knocking on the door? Can we run a telehealth service? But next week's problem is uh, potentially different. Next month's problem is potentially different. Um, if you've got staff, how long are you prepared to keep paying your staff? Um, if you've got rent, you want to look closely at your lease agreement because uh, a lot of you will have the opportunity if you can't operate your normal business um, to renegotiate your lease or not pay your rent. Um, so that's a clause that came out of the, uh, the earthquake in Christchurch, I believe. So there is definitely scope to try and reduce some costs. But then at some point, we're all going to start seeing patients again. And how are we going to do that? Are we going to be happy that coronavirus has disappeared and that we're going to just resume normal business just like that? Or do we need to be starting to source um, some PPE for your, uh, your therapists? Do we need to start thinking about um, bulk ordering hand sanitizer? Um, because there are a lot of companies that will order these for you, but they're ordering them for delivery in May. So if you order them in May, there's a really high likelihood that you will not be able to get these things until June or July. And I guarantee you, you're going to want them in May. Um, your staff will want them in May and your patients will want them in May. So I think um, not about telehealth, but telehealth is the flavor of the month. But what is the next crisis that we're all going to have? And I think it's making sure that we're future proofing ourselves for the next, you know, one month, two months, three months, and four months. Um, and I don't know, I, our practice was quite ad hoc until quite recently, but, you know, we've got a five year forecast. We're trying to do some financial planning and, and uh, trying to be a little bit more responsible as we've had more staff members. Um, at what point does your business uh, become non-sustainable if your referral numbers become X or Y? So these are all really, really hard conversations and hard thoughts to have, but I think the time to be having them is, is now. Um, so, oh, there's a few more questions here that I've, I've missed. So when you're saying six months, have you had information that suggests we won't be able to see patients face to face for six months? Um, no. So that's definitely not true. Um, what do I think is probable? Well, I think it's probable that this one month will extend out and I don't think we'll be seeing patients in one month. Um, I don't think it will go to six months. I think we'll probably, this is again my personal opinion based on um, talking with my friends who are doctors in other areas, um, based on talking to, to people that kind of my business mentor and the like. Um, I think three months, six months is a reasonable time to consider your broader plan. So I think if you're planning on being back to work as normal in four weeks, I think that you are likely to be deluded. Um, what I guess I'm saying is make sure that you're thinking about if we did go back to work in four weeks, what is that likely to be? Well, I think there'll still be lots of patients that don't want to come see you. Um, I think that there still won't be any organized sport. I think that there'll still be um, a reduced number of people coming through your door. Um, I think there'll still be sick people out in the community with uh, COVID-19. So this is, uh, I guess, it's a fairly bleak conversation, but I think I suspect the people that might have logged on here um, and just looking at some names are, are probably more likely to be the ones that own practices rather than uh, that are contractors or employees. Um, I think we need to be thinking about that and what the future is going to be because it's, it's not easy for us and it's not easy for anyone. Um, so have I had any direct information? No. Um, 
a comment here. I believe physios won't be back to clinic until alert level drops to two. Even at three, we can't go back to clinic, so it may take longer than people think. Um, and yeah, I, I think you need to be thinking three to six months. Um, my personal belief, uh, and I'm involved with New Zealand football, and we haven't really discussed this uh, at, at any in any level of detail, but I would be very surprised if we had organised sport this year. So I think hockey's made the decision to not play this year. I could be wrong, but I would imagine that rugby, football, um, netball will probably fall into line with that. So it doesn't mean that people can't start playing some football and uh, doing it at a more kind of recreational or social level. Um, but I think organised sport is, is not going to happen for a period of time. So... Um, does um, my, qu my question answering is not going so good. So even if a patient does not want a telehealth consultation, a monthly five minute chat unpaid could be a good way to remain in communication with them for when a clinic is back up and running. So look, I th that, that's, that's a, a very good point. So um, a five minute chit chat with someone is probably not gonna satisfy ACC and it's not gonna be something that we'd feel good about billing. Um, but it is a good way of maintaining a relationship. So I think that that's a really good option. Uh, one thing that I discussed with our admin team this morning was some patients tell them that they just don't want to have a telehealth consultation and they want to wait till we're back on deck. So I've asked them to say to them, look, it could be quite a long time. Um, you could be waiting for several months before you have a face-to-face -face conversation. Um, would you like to talk to one of our doctors about what a telehealth conversation might look like. Um, and then it gives us the opportunity to, to tell them and explain a little bit about what it's worth. And my impression is maybe that might segue into a consultation. So it may be that once they have uh, started to discuss their problem to some extent, that they then may find actually that this is a medium that interests them and they think they can achieve something. Um, Sometimes uh, some of the patients don't want to come see us because they're not going to get what they want. So some of them are clearly wanting an MRI scan or they're clearly wanting some imaging. Um, and so being able to have our admin team tell them that that's still an option if their problem is acute enough um, makes them want to book an appointment. So it may be that for you guys, the possibility of still being able to uh, see you be treated, still be referred on for an opinion and still source normal stuff like an opinion from a surgeon or um, an MRI scan or work certificate or whatever it is, maybe having a clear understanding that those things are still available to them might mean that they're more likely to book in with you. So it's about saying, what are, what, why are the reasons that your patients might not be coming? A lot of them are, they're not injured, they're not playing sport, but a lot of them might be, they don't understand what they're going to achieve through telehealth. They don't understand that actually there's still a, a full suite of services available to them if they've got a problem that's acute enough. So those are all things that we might be considering and talking to people about in terms of um, maintaining our business. The cold hard reality today, um, I, I think our referrals will be down at least 50%. Um, and so that's what we're in the short term preparing for. And I have no idea. I'm actively going out trying to get as many patients referred to us as I possibly can because I, I want to maintain um, my business. I want to keep patients coming through the door. Um, but I just, I just can't see us maintaining anything like a normal, um, a normal pattern. So we will have to change. Um, and I suspect that probably that's a reality for all of you. So um, normal business, if you like, will drop down. Where are the areas to keep people going? And is there some innovation that we can do to, to kind of keep people going through this phase? Um, you talked about the, the, the workplace setup, which I think is a really good way or good response to this. Um, we're thinking about um, maybe we could repurpose some of our admin staff and doctors to do some um, non-clinical work around um, setting up processes and other things that means that in six months time, um, we've got a better service for people. We're looking to implement a new patient management software um, in six months time. Can we have that ready to go? So there are some tough decisions. We have to invest in that. We have to invest in a new patient and software. How, what's our level of comfort in expending money when our business is uh, potentially uh, losing money? So um, I think we're all in the same boat with those sorts of things. Um, 
Regarding the ones that don't currently want telehealth conversation, might pay to schedule a call in two to four weeks uh, to see how they're coping. Yeah, look, absolutely good idea. Um, but maybe a call right now might mean that they're more likely to book. So um, I think it's about understanding what the, the problems that your practice might have um, and having a clear strategy about what's doing, what to do about them. The other thing um, I think has become critically apparent is the need to be uh, open and clear with everybody about what, what's going on. So I think the thing that might become a little bit of a, a, a cancer within our practices is a lack of information. So if, uh, if your staff don't know what's happening uh, with your practice and you're not talking to them about what could happen, then I think that that could be really bad and negative. Um, our staff in general understand that we're not seeing as many patients. They understand that changes will be made um, and they're keen to be part of those conversations. So yeah, we started off talking about telehealth and now we're talking about trying to forecast the future um, and how to run our businesses. But uh, I think they're all interesting conversations. Um, another question from Luke. Are all access sports specialists listed online currently available? Um, are these telehealth or face-to-face -face for non-emergency but still urgent injuries? So yes, at, at the moment, all of our staff are available um, and will likely continue to be available, but um, the way that we work has changed a lot. And at the moment, we're 100% telehealth. Um, we are open to the idea of running acute clinics for people with uh, significant need. So um, some patients are going to want or need injections some patients are going to want or need uh, a face-to-face -face assessment and we're working through that now. So our plan will be to do all business as usual consultations through telehealth. Um, when we identify someone that we can't uh, service properly through telehealth and we can't delay that or send them to the hospital or, uh, or find another alternative, we're planning on running some face-to-face -face consultations. Um, so I hope that answers your question uh, here, Luke. Um, I think Sarah's put her hand up. Are you wanting to say something, Sarah? I'm gonna give you a chance to, why well, don't you put your hand down now? <laughs> so uh, panicked when I offered you the microphone. So look, um, I feel that uh, the, the key take home messages are, this is an unbelievably evolving um, situation. Uh, I think we won't, we we'll never have, or I hope we never have anything else like this in our careers ever to, to deal with again. Um, telehealth is, I think, a really powerful tool, but there are some limitations and there is a learning curve. And I think being able to, to share those experiences with people, I think, uh, is, is the best way to get good at it quickly. Um, the other part of it is around just what, how long is this going to last? And the answer is a long time. So I think if you plan for six months and it is only one month, then you know that's great. Um, but if you plan for six months, I think that that is a realistic time frame to think about maybe being back to business as usual, um, because it's it's not going to be business as usual at the end of this you know four week lockdown. All the comms out of the, the government are that it's a minimum of four weeks. Um, there is no fixed end date to that at the moment. So. Those, are, I think, are all things that are worth uh, keeping in mind. So look, um, this was the last of the webinars that we've scheduled in. Uh, we are looking to run uh, one or two next week. Um, it would be good, actually, if uh, people could let me know whether they think this format has been good, um, whether the time of 8 o'clock is a good one, um, whether having one a night is, is way too many, whether it's good. Um, and what possible topics uh, we could be looking to, to run or deliver. So um, from our point of view, we found it, well, I found it very rewarding. I've enjoyed it. Um, it's been relatively easy to set up and run. Um, so if there are things that you want, um, please email me, um, please send me some messages, um, and uh, we are gonna look to source people from outside the clinic uh, so that we can have uh, a broader range of, of experience. So um, I hope, uh, Week one has been okay for you all, uh, and I look forward to, uh, to catching up with you all in due course. Thanks a lot.